student artists on our roster, um, primarily hip hop based. And it's a little bit about me. Hey everyone, I'm Francesca Harvey. Um, I work for Partisan Records. I head up our audience development department, which is split between London and New York. We work with PJ Harvey, Idols, Fela Kuti catalog, um, and a bunch of other cool artists. Hi everyone, my name is Benita Lotkunga. I'm head of marketing at Sideways Media. We are a comms and digital agency based in Los Angeles and Nashville. Hi everyone, my name is Leslie Rosales. I am the head of marketing at Rostrum Records. We are a Los Angeles based um, label. And hi everyone, I'm Ryan Whitman. I head up digital marketing at The Orchard. We're a global distributor under the Sony umbrella. Thank you. Before we get started, Raise your hands, how many artists do we have in the room? Really? Distributors? Publishers? Labels? Managers? Okay, labels, you win. <laughs> For now. Let's just, uh, let's get into it. Ryan, what do you think about digital marketing? What comes to mind? I think a lot about it. <laughs> All day, in fact. Yeah. Well, if we're talking about digital marketing, this is probably something that a lot of you in the room know since we're talking to a lot of people within the business. But a lot of people can think digital marketing, social media marketing, but it really goes beyond that. We're looking at the whole digital landscape. Social media is definitely part of it, but we're also looking at CRM efforts like email lists, your community line, whatever text line you're utilizing. We're looking at different experiences in the digital realm. Maybe it's a website, a splash page, a game. We're looking at digital advertising. So it really goes far beyond just your social media marketing. Thank you. And um, Ryan, again with you, building a strategy um, before you do anything um, with digital marketing, what should we look out for? Tell us about some campaign goals. How do we set those? What should we set them for? Yeah, so when we're talking about utilizing a smaller budget, it's so important to think thoughtfully and wisely about how we're really looking to utilize that budget and what the goals are. A lot of people will come in, they'll say, I have this budget, I'm rearing to go, and I just want to do this. And then you say, okay, why are we doing it? What, what's the why? What is the goal? What's the intention of how we're utilizing these funds? You have to look at where is my artist really activated? Where are the fans at? And what exactly am I trying to get from this? Are we looking at driving consumption? Are we looking at driving the awareness of the artist? Are we looking at engaging the core fans, engaging new fans? So that's really where we've all kind of talked about this behind the scenes of before we even look at swiping the credit card or getting that money going, why exactly are we utilizing this budget in the first place? And what do we want to get out of it? And what KPIs are we going to be looking at as our end result to say this was a success? And if you spread those goals a bit too widely, then you're not really going to see that return if you're utilizing a smaller budget. Leslie, how much should we spend on, what's the minimum budget we should be spending? In my experience, I've worked at both a major and indie label. At a major, I've spent up to 100K on a digital budget. Um, at an indie label now, we spend at minimum 10K per budget. But I, I think for independent artists, they should really concentrate. Instead of focusing on digital marketing, they should really focus on the art first, which is music and even the content that comes out with the art um, before spending on the digital side. That's a very good point, very good point. Let's see, Benita. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you should have in place before or during the strategy um, portion of your budgeting? What should you think about? Really good music. No, <laughs> I'm hoping that's the case. But um, I like to think about going back to the basics. Um, I've seen this with developing artists to artists who have headlined major festivals. But getting down to the basics of, for example, an artist's website that's up to date that has foundationally been set up for you to do advertising, it has a pixel in place, you have things set up for email sign up. Because um, reali in reality, like your artist website is yours to own. You're at the mercy of all these other platforms, but if they disappear, what next? And so it is your job as a label, as a manager, or whatever, as an artist to make sure that you are continually building upon your data points and having everything set up in place. So that also makes 
you know, sense having trackable links and um, who owns like your business manager page because those are the things that always pop up and it takes time to kind of get. But you want to make sure that those things are connected, that your Instagram is connected to your Facebook and those are all things that you'll be building within the first campaign that you're on to the next one. And so you just want to make sure that the foundation is set to kind of grow and build to the next one. Francesca, can you tell us a little bit more about Pixel, what that is, and how you can use that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really important to set it up ahead of time. It can take a little bit of time to get the business manager in place, like Benita said. Um, and then just making sure you have tracking across all the artist properties, especially before running something like a conversion campaign where you're not going to be able to see ads to cart or purchases. And then you're not going to be able to really quantify if the spend is working unless you have that in place. It's very important. Thank you. Can you talk to us a little bit more about platform connectivity, Benita? Um, I mean, platform ca connectivity, like I brought it up a little bit with things like a meta and a business manager. I've seen it across the board where people are like, oh, well, our old agency has access to it or an old management company. And those are things that I think the artist should own, especially in the independent world. It's like you should own it. I think it's really easy to like let go of it and give it to someone else to do, but you should always kind of see how things are doing and have things set up on the back end. So that means, you know, making sure your Facebook and your Instagram are connected. So when you do run campaigns, like it can actually um, perform better and you can kind of see where like the conversions are happening. Um, Francesca, I think we had a conversation about that the other day too. It's like, oh, you spend X, Y, Z on Facebook, but you didn't have it connected to the Instagram. There's kind of like lost data points there. And so you're just kind of like throwing things at the wall when you could have things perform so much better. That's a good point. Yeah, you don't want to just be wasting your money out there. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Let's talk about some ways to spend and where not to spend. Francesca, what are your top three platforms? Yeah, I think Meta is still probably the most important platform for artists. It's just, you can get so granular with the music targeting and mostly on Instagram and Facebook, there's already so much historical data you can tap into. So being able to build a remarketing audience before you even start a campaign and being able to spend a, sometimes a pretty small amount if you're very specific with that targeting. Um, and then Google, YouTube, I think similarly, you can spend a pretty small amount and have it go pretty far to put behind a video, a short, a search ads, or just boosting a product feed that you have. Um, and then I would say TikTok is becoming increasingly an important plat platform for advertising. Um, and again, somewhere where you can spend a fairly small amount if the artist is engaged with the platform and has a presence there already um, can go pretty far. So let's say we, we tap into our budget, we tapped into the minimum. How do I know when to spend more money or should I spend more money? What kind of markers should I be looking out for? Just Fran <laughs> excuse me, Francesca. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I would say, so when you're, sorry, actually, <laughs> I wasn't listening to the question. <laughs> Me either. Um, um, yeah, I mean, anyone can take it, or if you want to repeat sure. the question. Sure, yeah, for anybody then. Basically, when should I spend more money? So if I see something is a little bit more successful, do I spend more? Do I not spend? Do I stick to the budget? I, I mean, I think when you're thinking about budgets, you have to think of it, uh, it being malleable. It's never set in stone, and the whole point is that data is going to drive and inform your decisions. So, like, you never want to stick to one thing. Like, if it's not working, adjust it. And with digital, it's a lot easier to do that. You're like, this audience isn't working. Let's try a different audience. Let's try a different target audience because it's not like a traditional um, paid advertisements. You're like, I'm paying for half a page. It's out there. I paid the fee, whatever. So when things start to go off, a song is doing really well on TikTok, you're like, wow, okay, the sound is going off or on reels. Lean into it. Create content into it. Um, target those audiences. You know, we've seen artists who do covers and we're like, oh, this random song with this artist is really coming off. So we're going to target those audiences and those those artists um, that the songs are being covered for. So, I mean, definitely advertising paid media is very malleable and I don't think anyone should ever be like, this is the, the roadmap that we have to stick to because I don't think you'd be spending wisely at all. 
Yeah, I, I can just add to that. Um, I think also going straight to the source when you're looking at the results, because sometimes you'll be hitting all the benchmarks and things seem like they're going well. But if you're not tracking streaming or tracking sales or tracking mm -hmm. ticket sales, then it's hard to know exactly if it's connecting to the next level. And that can just be a useful way. Like maybe you're seeing that streams are plateauing and then you double the budget and then see if maybe they do spike and then if they don't, then maybe it's time to pull back on the spend. Um, so alongside the usual reporting that you're getting, just actually looking at the next level to make sure things are connecting. Leslie, what are your thoughts on TikTok influencers or just influencer campaigns in general? <laughs> my opinion is the unpopular opinion. Um, in my experience, uh, I worked on a campaign where we spent 100000 on a TikTok campaign and influencers, and we saw no uptick in streaming. The song, and we had a huge feature on a song. The song was tied in with a movie. It brought a lot of awareness to the movie, but it did nothing for streaming. So even with an artist leaning in, there's no guarantee that you'll see an uptick on streaming. So it is good to be mindful to have or, or consider a spend on TikTok, but just be aware that it doesn't necessarily mean um, you'll get a return. Do you I have your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, I think like we've had a bit, well, we've had a similar experience in that We've never spent $100,000 on a TikTok influencer campaign. But I think like a few years ago when it was what everybody was talking about, um, when we would invest in agency, we did start to see like there wasn't an immediate return. But I think now what we're seeing is the more that we learn, especially like with the increase of Instagram reels these days, um, and we understand that a lot of like what drives a trending song is going to be both consumption and production. And so the approach that we've been taking is a more grassroots approach instead of just like hiring an agency that maybe they just have a network of influencers that aren't necessarily in touch with, you know, like our artists or our brand. What we're trying to do is just review like songs that are doing well and see what creators are driving that consumption and which creators are driving the production of that music. And then we're keeping a track of that. I think like at Reach specifically, we have a little bit of a more niche audience. And so there's a lot of crossover between the fans across our artists. So we just have a list of creators that were pretty much just like, oh, we have a great socials team and they're just DMing these creators pretty consistently. And we're finding that like, for an agency where a minimum spend is $5,000 for maybe like six creators, we're able to build with people that are, that have sus like substantial platforms, but also are champions of our artists and our music. And we're able to get a much lower rate. Like for example, I think recently we invested $3,000 and we're able to get, um, 10 creators that were very invested, specifically posting on Instagram where we were seeing a lot of that growth. So I do agree that like the traditional agency way isn't necessarily, you're not gonna see you know, much return, but being really, really strategic and scrappy to your creator strategy, I think you'll start to see, um, yeah, you'll, you, I think we, you'll start to see results that way. Let's talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, organic content. Leslie, we spoke about in-person activations. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. So pre-pandemic, and even now, I'm very big on in-person activations. We spent the last three years basically inside the house. Um, and now fans want to be outside. They want to go to artist-driven events and go to concerts and festivals. Um, digital marketing is such a big pillar in marketing but nothing, there's no, nothing bigger than actual human connection and core memories made with fans who can actually see their favorite artists in real life, see them, hear them perform live, uh, take a picture with them or get an autograph. So I'm very big on being outside um, and connecting with fans. Can you give us an example of one that you've, of, of a, a campaign that you've run that way? Yeah, um, back in March, I did just a random pop-up activation with an artist of ours at Rostrum. 
Um, he's from Milwaukee and he had a hometown show. Uh, the idea was for him to have just a pop-up listening. So he had a hometown show a week before the album came out. So on IG, he posted, meet me at this address at 6 p.m. I'll play the album for you guys. At 6 p.m., like 300 fans showed up to this Milwaukee address. Um, my artist literally just stood on top of his friend's car, put out a big speaker, and played songs from his album. And his fans went crazy. Like, it was controlled chaos. They were just very excited that something was happening. One, something was happening in Milwaukee. Uh, <laughs> two, it's like their hometown hero doing something special for them. So um, we got a lot of content from, from that event. And then we did a digital spend a week before the album came out on that content. And the event was free. It literally cost us nothing. So there's a lot of like dope stuff that we can do in person wise without spending anything. That kind of makes sense. Um, doing in person first, capturing content, and then yeah. using digital marketing yep. to kind of push that forward. And it's really cool to hear that too, because I think like we, you know, after COVID, just we stopped investing as much into those in-person activations and now like in the last year or so you have artists that are wanting to do that more and I think you just when you have a limited budget you want to be able to invest in the things that actually make sense and it's just really encouraging to hear an example of like here's a creative way that you can have that fan engagement and you can come back to your team and show actual results like mm -hmm. thank you for sharing that because I think that that's really exciting yeah uh, I mean it's proof of concept yeah. that he has fans and people care um content is so key it's exciting Dee, we talked about different ways that we could spend this budget and avoiding huge budgets on music videos. What's another way we could spend that money? Yeah, so something that um, we've really started to implement over the last couple of years is instead of, um, you know, spending thousands, thousands of dollars on this, like, overproduced video, especially ahead of release when you don't know if that's a release that's necessarily going to resonate right away. Um, we know that short form content drives the majority of our streams for a lot of our artists. And so rather than really going all in on a traditional music video, we've really just um, adjusted our budget to make sure that all of our releases are getting some type of um, vertical like performance video that we can feed out to socials. Now, some of our artists do really well with short form content. so they'll kind of, they know what works with their audience and sometimes they'll just do it themselves and then we can repurpose whatever we would have budgeted for a video or, you know, for any sort of shoot, we can repurpose that towards advertising. Some of our other artists aren't as comfortable, you know, in front of uh, a selfie camera or creating that content. So the way that we've been able to adjust and pivot that is by um, doing these more produced short form performance videos that we know are going to do really, really well with short form content. But then again, we're not spending, you know, three, five, some artists, $10,000 on a music video with a song that we're not, you know, 100% sure that's going to hit market. And then of course, uh, sorry, hit market, but that's going to perform as well as other releases. So we're really finding that, you know, you can invest $1,000 with a great director and have a quality visual that's like, you, you can get, you know, five vertical videos that then you can put advertising spend behind. You can be really creative with how you see it out on socials. And then that just frees up a lot more of our budget to be able to put into digital advertising spend. Francesca, can you speak to the importance of CRM? Yeah, I think when you're thinking about spending wisely, CRM is just a really easy way to spend no money outside of your monthly subscription. And it's a way to bring, to get your audience in one place and you own the data and it's your core super fans. So the highest return on every email that goes out, I think, in, compared to an ad. And I think like when we're doing in-person events or short form video plans, just making sure that you're driving into that audience and growing it so that you can continue to capitalize on it and, and also reward the fans that are 
taking the action to subscribe and are reading all of your emails. Um, but definitely the highest conversions that we see are through emails. What so. do you use for your email? Um, I, I still really like MailChimp. I think like for artists, it's a good starting point. But um, we also use ActiveCampaign and MailerLite and some of the other ones. Yeah, I don't know what ones you guys use or if you have any We're favorites. MailChimp, but I'm always curious. Yeah. yeah. Somewhere. <laughs> Brian, can you talk to us about some best practices when spending? Should yeah. I have daily limits, lifetime spend? Yeah, definitely. I think it really depends on what your goals are and what you're looking to do, as we were talking about earlier in the conversation. At The Orchard, we split things up. So we have an advertising team that's handling our ad budget throughout the campaign. And then on the digital marketing side, we utilize the budget in different ways, from influencer campaigns to games and websites. But if we're talking about an influencer campaign, kind of as we've all discussed, you really it's not a given that something's going to happen. So when we're looking at how we're going to utilize that budget, there's a few different instances where we're looking at an influencer campaign being beneficial. The main one, of course, is that some trend is already taking off around the song, which really comes back to the idea of organic content and having content be the key. Is who's going to get the ball rolling? Is it going to be the artist? Is it going to be the fans? Or is it going to be money? And when it's money, how's that going to look organic? How's it going to look like something that people aren't going to be able to see through so transparently? Mm -hmm. So it's always best to kind of set yourself up with the content and then start rolling things out. So if you're working with a smaller budget, Perhaps if there's not something already that's sticking out as the lead, maybe doing something smaller with a company that can do an open cat call where people can come in and they can just do whatever content they want to do. The top uh, performing videos then end up getting paid from those creators. But after that, you really have to say, well, what's our next step? Talking about those successful KPIs. So we've seen that this trend is taking off the most. So maybe we take some of those influencers, and if we don't have a lot of budget left, throw that to advertising and have them utilize the boost codes to get those videos promoted more. If we do have budget, maybe then we do a more specified round of influencers looking at a different, more key demographic, getting those people on that trend. So yeah, it really depends on how much you have to work with. But on a smaller budget, that's really where we're looking to go. And uh, as for daily spends, I'm not sure if anyone has any thoughts on the advertising side when it comes to how much you want to be spending. Yeah, I, th I think it's so variable depending on what, what you're running a campaign around and what the budget is to begin with. Um, so it's a little hard to say. Um, I think with something like a boost though, you can do a bit with like $100. Like we found on TikTok running a $100 boost behind a video that an artist has put up if they already are on the platform and have a built-in audience, that can get like 300,000 views. So it's a really good, really small amount to, to put in. And similarly on, on like Meta and Instagram, some, sometimes you need to put that kind of spend behind a post just so that the existing audience sees it the, with the way that the algorithm works now. Um, but that could be, you know, $100 over like a few days just to make sure that you're hitting the existing people out there. So, yeah. And something to add to that too, I think when people ask like, do I do daily or lifetime spend? If you have the time and the budget to test, test your audiences. And that's where something like a daily spend would be really helpful. You're like, we're doing 10, $25 a day on something. And that's where you can really see who, like what your content is resonating with, like who your audiences are, maybe you need to adjust. And so that's, it goes back to like setting yourself up for success. If you're not releasing something until quarter four, but you're touring and doing things in, earlier in the year, that's when you should be doing your testing. You bring up a good point there. So analyzing data, we've set up the campaigns, they're running. How do we take that data and use it impactfully? Anita. Um, I mean, data is there to inform all of your strategic marketing kind of decisions and, and your own map. I think it's there to tell you, you know, like what is resonating? Like, is my creative just not hitting? Is a headline not where it needs to be? Is the target audience completely off? I think it's also really surprising when you run a campaign, you're like, 
okay, this is not the target audience that we imagined at all. And so you kind of learn from that. And data is there to really build upon, you know, that first campaign to the next one. Um, back to CRM, it's like mailing lists to me are so important. Um, if you are touring and you don't have anything out for email sign up, like that is a disservice to you because like your return with an email list and a fan, those are your super fans. And when you have a massive email list, you can target specifically to them for merch, for ticket sales, anything. Like your ads can get so detailed. Like why do I get an ad specifically for, I don't know, like suitcases because I clicked on one ad. Like it's kind of creepy how well these things are. And so like if someone's listening to your song or they've clicked on a video once, like you're just so much further along than, than you wouldn't be if you didn't have that data capture. And so data is there to really help you all along the way. Francesca, what, is a, what data points reveal success? What does that look like? Yeah, I think they're like standard benchmarks that across the platforms that, that will vary campaign to campaign. But I, I think, like I was saying before, just going straight to the source and looking at what, where it's actually impacting sales and streams is really important. Because um, like we've been talking a bit about how influencer campaigns sometimes don't impact streams and then it's that's a moment where you would want to pivot that spend and um i think like yeah on tiktok we we don't necessarily always see streams picking up from the spend but it's sometimes it's useful to grow the follower audience count there and then you can have the artists run pre-save campaigns and then that impacts the streams when the song comes out so really going going straight to looking at what is actually connecting. And I think too, another like metric that to just when you're considering like reinvestment and also even just like an initial spend on a release is yes, like streaming and then also like really being aware of like where, like which territory is streaming picking up in. Like I think, um, cause then that you can be really, really wise. Like if you have a limited advertising strat or spend, but you see that like, it's this artist, like we have an artist specifically that, um, has just started doing really, really, really well in Brazil. Um, and it recently just became his top territory. And so we've pivoted a lot of our strategy. Like now the, the little, the influencer, um, strategy and network that we were that I was alluding to earlier now we're looking more into like Brazil Brazilian creators um, and then also like able to reinvest into that like those specific markets where it's really picking up as well how can an artist leverage data from ads and digital marketing to maybe secure more funding for anybody Um, I mean, I think definitely looking across all platforms um, and being able to curate a great story. Um, I mean, I think, and it also depends like where you're getting funding from. Like, is it the artist going to the label? Typically for us, uh, we're pretty tapped in. Um, but, you know, like if an artist is you know, they're like, hey, I want to do an in-person event or, hey, I want to do a music video. Um, I'm usually, like, we're, our team is usually pretty aware of what's happening, but if when they, you know, when they're tapped into, like, their Spotify for artists or they can, actually, a really good example of this recently was an artist showed us um, a reel and the, he was looking at um, the new, uh, like the unreached audience or like how much of his audience was followers followers versus like non-follower ratio. And that to us was like, oh, these clips are doing really, really well for this song. You're expanding your audience. Therefore, we'll do what you, in this case, he wasn't asking for funding, but it motivated us to, you know, release the song quicker than he had Asked. And so I think like, yeah, being able to look at all the platforms, understand where it's doing really well, curate a story as, and, and understanding where the consumption is coming from, I think is a great way for an artist to present to a label or to another partner to be able to secure. So maybe like brand partnerships. Yeah. Where the label doesn't have to spend more money. Somebody else can. I think we all like that. 
Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'd like to open it up for any questions for our panelists. We have about 15 minutes left. Hi. Um, I just wanted to uh, kind of bring up like landing pages where you're sending people. We, um, you know, we use Tone Den and we use uh, uh, like a fan link. Mm -hmm. And I've just seen like a massive, massive drop off of how many people are hitting the fan link and how many people are then clicking through to other services. So I was wondering if you guys tend to maybe send people direct to Spotify on one ad, maybe direct to Apple on another ad, or if you're still trying to use these landing pages. Yeah. That's a, a really good question. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we definitely, especially in European territories with GDPR, we started to see mm -hmm. people drop off when we would send them to like a multi-link. Um, so we just divide it up and get very granular with where we're sending people based on the ad and the targeting. Uh, but for a larger album campaign, we'll, we'll build out a landing page ourselves and then we can put the video at the top, streaming links, and then have the products embedded, have a mailing list sign up, and that way we can get pretty dynamic with switching it around even in the middle of the campaign. If something we can see with Google um, Tag Manager, we can see where people are clicking and then move things around based on what they're clicking through to most. Um, so that can be, that feels like the most useful way to do it, even though it can be a bit more costly. It ends up being more cost effective in the long term. Got it, thank you. Anybody no, else? Has anything, anything to add. <laughs> no, I agree with that. I think you have to kind of set aside a budget to be and get granular and send to specific platforms because there is a, a big drop off Huge. for sure. Like you kind of lose the. We do a section where we normally allocate, you know, for the landing page because I do think data capture can be important in that space. You don't always know where people are going to to click on, so we do save a little bit there. But then we'll have another ad set that is specific to Spotify or like wherever like you're sending. So yeah, I do think you have to actually set up those ad sets to really control it. So it's more work and you kind of have to watch it closely, mm -hmm. but in the long run, like Francesca said, it's going to be, you'll be better off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you guys. Mm -hmm. I have a specific question for Francesca because you mentioned the Fela Kuti catalog. Um, I work in catalog, so I wanted to know what you've done how involved has the estate been? How have you gotten around the challenges of working with an artist who's, who's 25 years gone and counting, but with you know an ever-growing you know name recognition? What what kind of campaigns have you done? Yeah, um, we actually some of our most successful conversion campaigns are for the Fela Kuti catalog because there's such a big remarketing audience and also a very big mailing list that we have continued to grow and invest in. Um, so I think we're lucky to have an archive of material to work with. We have a lot of really amazing video footage and a lot of amazing photos. So I think the content is really important and we've used what we have to work with on the archival side and incorporated like final unpacking videos and mixed that in with old live footage and showed off packaging of reissues and things like that. And then sending those ads first just to the existing remarketing audience usually we see very high return on ad spend. And is that, is that mostly towards physical or what, what, in the, what yeah. about the digital space? Yeah, so we also, um, we've rolled out a lot of edits in, in the last few years on Spotify. Um, and then we'll drive directly to Spotify um, and we'll run edits on YouTube um, also when we have new visualizers and, uh, and those perform really well too. I think with an artist like Fela Kuti that has been around so long, there's so, such a big audience out there, so it's just about bringing everyone onto the owned channels so that you can give them the information they want. All right, thank you very much. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Bob Carsey with Arcadia Records. I'm wondering if, if it's independent of each other or in terms in addition to advertising paid advertising on digital media, how do you integrate and coordinate social media posts between yourself or the artist uh, in terms of one integrated campaign? Um, I mean, I think 
if you were here for the panel for like the engaged fan marketing thing, that was a really good start. Like you should always have a plan in place. It's gonna be organic social content, but I always view paid as kind of like your best content. Like this is your chance for like a first impression, potentially new fans. And so you're leaning with your best marketing and content there so like for us we will either save it for like release days or like really good content that we feel like is gonna you know capture new fans and and kind of engage and activate new fans in that way so you kind of have to pinpoint like where it makes sense to put money behind but like i'm always behind like you should be spending money to make money and um that is a good idea to just keep in mind like that you're saving your best content to kind of because it's like a first chance. Sometimes it's your only chance with advertising. They might say it once, and that's your own chance. So you want to make sure it looks good. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Hey, what's going on? Uh, my Hi. name is Nice on the Sonics. Um, I'm a senior engineer at Platinum Sound Studios under Jerry Wonder. Um, I have a lot of clients as an audio engineer, and they often ask me advice about you know getting plays or getting numbers for their platforms. But one phenomenon that I see often is. Um, it'll be an artist where the majority of their fan base, they follow them on Apple Music. they really into Apple Music, but Apple Music doesn't show numbers and it doesn't show publicly show the data or the numbers, so they want to develop themselves on Spotify or on another platform. What do you feel like is the best way to grow, um, I guess, like Spotify on a different platform when their main base or their core base is already tuned in to, to Apple Music or or receiving their music in one particular platform, how do you grow another platform? Like, what are the best ways, especially like when budgeting? When it comes to an organic side of things, we really talk about creating unique opportunities and experiences at those different DSPs to get the fans over there. What kind of content are we creating? For instance, something that would be super easy is creating a Spotify playlist that's linked to the artist's profile. And maybe that playlist is one that's updated monthly or bi-weekly. And it's songs that the artist is listening to currently, of course, with their own song as number one, because who doesn't like a little free press for yourself? But taking that opportunity as well to connect to core audiences, peers as well, you know, if you're putting on, like I love Brandy, so maybe I put a Brandy song on and I'll tag her on socials and be like, check out the playlist, here are the new artists that I added, loving this Brandy song, hoping that also Brandy will interact with it, hoping that fans will interact with it, and showing fans, I'm active over here, this is what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Or things like maybe a Pandora Stories activation or an Amazon Spotlight, really taking advantage of what each platform has to offer. Mm -hmm. And then putting ad spend behind like the playlist too. Like those do really, really and well. If you're like, here's my workout playlist and uh, you don't say it in that voice, but, and then you just like <laughs> shoot it out on TikTok. Like I feel like those perform very well. Yeah. yeah. Piggyback what they said as, as far as playlists. Um, I would say, you know, the focus for them shouldn't be trying to convert the Apple listeners to be Spotify users. Okay. Um, you ha they have them at Apple. Most likely, they're just going to stay on Apple. So your focus for the other platforms is gaining new fans who are Spotify listeners, who are Amazon Music listeners, et cetera. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Ryan, I like that you brought up Pandora because I love that Pandora has free advertising. Yeah, and I, I feel like there are so many platforms like that, like in Bands in Town, Songkick, where you can just go and message your entire audience there. Some artists have like, you know, tens of thousands of followers that they didn't even realize they can go in and hit them up to say they have a new show. So taking advantage of all those free tools in as many platforms as possible. Yeah, agreed. Um, like Bands in Town, for example, like I've seen artists have bigger followings on Bands in Town than email lists. So if you don't have an email list, start there then. I think that that's really what a lot of the conversation that we've had really comes back to is we've all talked about thoughtfulness with a smaller budget and really taking the steps to really do everything you can on your own before you start to bring in that budget, utilizing the free tools, creating the content, engaging with fans, and finding ways to collect that first party data for email lists, text chains as well, so you know who those core fans are and really utilizing them to push forward the story before even diving into that small budget that you have to really make every single penny work for what you want to do. Ryan, can you talk to us about the importance of a pre-save link and promoting a single before it comes out? 
No, I cannot. I'm kidding. Okay. <laughs> Time to go. Yeah, definitely a super important part of this, especially because through the pre-saves, on our end, we're collecting data of people who are pre-saving the records. So then you're able to reach back out, reutilize that for ad retargeting, and then also just being able to put that story in front of our sales team and being able to present that to DSPs to say, this is the interest that's coming for my song or coming for my record, and to stimulate conversation about it. I've really loved people, well, artists, sharing their music a little bit early, whether it's just the chorus, or if they're like, this is the bridge to my new song, getting people utilizing the audio and getting those core fans activated. So by the time that it's out, there's already a story. Just don't wait super long. I get frustrated as a fan and a listener. I'm like, this has been months, let's do it. <laughs> Same. Hi. My name is Magali from Secret City Records. I have a question regarding um, TikTok and the influencers you were mentioning. You really haven't seen the conversion in streams most of the time. So is it something that for you has become like the conclusion or in your budget to you kind of keep still trying and put a bit of money on like song influencer or stuff like that? Mm -hmm. So even though in my experience, we haven't seen uh, a correlation on streaming, it does bring a lot of awareness to the song and artist. So there is a bit of benefit there. Um, so yeah, we still spend on TikTok. Um, we just know not to, we just have that expectation that it may not grow on streaming, but on the awareness side, there's definitely a lot of growth. Yeah, I think also if something is already connecting, then then it is a really good time to spend to kind of fuel the fire and make sure that things keep growing and to add to what's happening organically, and then it can be effective and add to what's what you're seeing already on streaming. Yeah, I think like rarely do we do we implement like an influencer spend on the first mm -hmm. uh, set of spending. So like typically once we see the song reacting is when we feel like, okay, this is a safe uh, investment. And then that, and we know that it's, and you know, you start to see the results. Mm. Reacting overall on many platforms or just TikTok? That's a great question. Um, typically, I think with our experience, not necessarily even TikTok, I actually feel like sometimes Reels, uh, we just perform better on Reels. So as soon as we see either that it's trending on Reels, and it's translating into streams. That's typically when we really start to invest. Thank you. We have two minutes left. Any questions? So, that's, I mean, in our case, it definitely varies on uh, the size of, of, like, their audience, right? So, um, 300K uh, plays in the uh, TikTok, like, it's like an average uh, average. Well, you guys might have a different answer for this, but I, for us, it's not necessarily, like, we don't price it based on views because you can't, it's really hard to guarantee it. I think some agencies will guarantee amount of views because they'll boost it but like for the way that we do it just in-house um we'll typically reach out and we'll get a quote and typically it'll vary but we recently got um a creator with four million tiktok followers and 300 400 thousand instagram followers that charged us seven hundred dollars to post both on tiktok and instagram and that was a very great rate um you will sometimes reach out to other influencers and they'll some of the numbers that they'll come back now i will say that's a very large influencer so i mean that that's a great rate for her but then also we'll reach out like i said we really try to go for people that are already resonating with our artists, they're champions of our artists. So I'm okay with investing in an influencer that has maybe 60,000 followers on TikTok because that we can start to build relationally. And so sometimes we'll get, a lot of times, the majority of our spend, we're paying maybe like $200 for a creator. Um, yeah. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you everybody for joining. Thank you.
If you need my cash app, I'll be out the door right there.